So today's lecture is going to be looking at some of the new methods that we're developing in our lab to address larger protein systems by solution NMR. And I think in the era of cryo-EM, I have to qualify myself to when I say larger protein systems. We're talking about protein systems that are between 100 to uh, 300 kilodaltons is what today I would consider large by solution NMR. And uh, just to set the scene, um, many of you are probably familiar with this. The starting point for many investigations uh, of, of proteins by solution NMR is this HSQC spectra that correlates the nitrogen chemical shift with the hydrogen chemical shift of the backbone AMI. This is what we commonly refer to as a fingerprint region of the protein. And uh, here, every amino acid in the primary sequence, uh, except for prolines, would have a, a peak. And the position of the peak det is determined by its unique electronic environment, which is as a result of its tertiary structures. Pretty much all NMR investigations start with this very simple spectra. If you're looking at proteins interacting with each other, a protein interacting with a small molecule, if you're looking at relaxation types experiments, relaxation dispersion cysts, kinetics, uh, if you want to do um, uh, measure RDCs, most of them start with this very simple spectra. And for this, to record such a simple spectra, um, it will probably take you, if you have a 100 micromolar sample, it will anywhere take you from about 20 to 30 minutes to record the spectra. But the bottleneck in using the spectra is our ability to correlate each one of these dots back to an amino acid in the primary sequence. If else, all we can say is that the flux that we add to it, which is either a drug or uh, another protein, binds to it and then changes the electronic environment, which in turn changes the peak position or the resonance position, what we call chemical shift perturbation. But we would not be able to tell anything more. Once we have the resonance assignment, where each one of these dots is correlated to an amino acid, now we can say what the binding surface is. Sometimes this could be direct, sometimes this could be allosteric, but we could tell a lot more information. So normally, how do we do this? How do we correlate each one of these dots to an amino acid in the primary sequence? That's typically done by a set of experiments called the triple resonance experiment. I'll briefly touch upon that, but what is the problem when we go to larger systems? So here I show you an HSQC spectra of um, two proteins. One is an eight kilodalton protein on your left and the other is an 80 kilodalton protein. What you can see is that within a given spectral real estate, which is anywhere from about five ppm to 11 ppm, this is where normally the, um, uh, the, the amide chemical shifts come. There's a lot more resonances on the 80 kilodalton protein than the eight kilodalton protein. So two things happen when we go to larger molecular weights. You get a lot of a lot more resonances, 10 times more resonances in this case, which causes spectral crowding. And the second thing that happens is that the line shape of these resonances um, becomes broader as you go to higher and higher molecular weight in solution NMR. So now that these are two compounding factors that limit our um, ability to tackle these large proteins. And when we do assignments, we normally use a set of triple resonance experiments, and I would like to think of them as, as a Lego block. So when you transfer magnetization from nitrogen to the carbonyl alpha, the nature has designed it in such a way that we go both ways, both ways in the sense we go, there's a coupling between the nitrogen and its own C alpha, and there's a coupling between the nitrogen and the neighboring C alpha, in this case, the N minus one C alpha. So you see two resonances here, you can see the resonance that is, um, I hope you can see my cursor moving, that is to own C alpha and the resonance to the neighboring C alpha. Typically, but not always, um, the resonance to its own C alpha is a little bit stronger compared to the neighboring C alpha. And the reason is because the coupling to its own C alpha is slightly larger um, comparing to the C alpha minus one. And again, this depends on the dihedral angles. So let's not take this as uh, always true, but it's generally true. Now, I know one of them is to its own C alpha, and I know one of them is to the neighboring C alpha. Now, for me to connect the Lego blocks, all I need to find is another strip where the C alpha minus one resonance matches with my C alpha resonance. And once I know this, I can just connect the Lego blocks, and I have a few uh, systems where I can 
precisely know which is the chemical shift based on the chemical position. For example, glycine has a unique C alpha chemical shift at 45. And based on that and knowing the primary sequence, we can finally lock in this, the resonance assignment. So this is the general nature of how triple resonance experiments are done. But what happens when you go to larger systems that I shall show you in the slide, I'm sitting on this particular resonance asking the question, where is my C alpha minus one? And they're going to be about four other people raising their hands, showing that I'm your C alpha minus one. But only one of them is the right answer. And this is what happens uh, in uh, what we refer to as a chemical shift degeneracy. Um, an analogy, if you want to take, let's say if you're sitting in a class with three people, and then you ask, hey, uh, which of your names begin with the letter S, there'll probably be one person raising their hands. If you're sat sitting in a class with a thousand people and you ask the same question, there are going to be 10 people who are raising their hands. And that's exactly what happens when we go to higher, larger proteins, you get this property of chemical chip degeneracy. How do we break this degeneracy? So what we do is that we go to other experiments. So the experiment that I told you is this experiment called the HNCA, where the transfer of magnetization from nitrogen goes both ways, one to its own C alpha, the other to the C alpha minus one. Now here we correlate the HSQC spectra, which is the NH correlation in a third dimension to its own C alpha and the C alpha minus one. If you have a degeneracy there, then what we do is that we go to an experiment called the HNCACB. Here we do an additional transfer and record instead of, instead of the C alpha frequency, we record the C beta frequency. And the hope and prayer here is that if you see a system with a degenerate C alpha, the C beta is different and thereby you can break the degeneracy. Let's go back to the example that I said, how many of you uh, have a name starting with A? Then you can go to the next um, question and say, how many of you uh, have your not name starting with S and your second letter is D? And then you'll, you'll have less number of people there. So that's the kind of experiments that we do. So we use multiple dimensions of matches. If the C alpha is the same, we look for differences in the C beta. If the C alpha and the C beta are the same, then we look for differences in the carbonyl. So these are the typical type of chemical shifts that we have in our hand to break this degeneracy. Now, typically what one does in a solution state NMR is run three pairs of experiment. And in all practicality, when you go to larger systems, you can only run about uh, five experiments. And I'll tell you why that is. Um, so the CA pair, and why do you run them in pairs? is because in, in this case, uh, you'll get two resonances. One is to your C alpha, the other to the C alpha minus one, but you don't know which one is which. You can generally use an intensity as a marker, but that's not a, a foolproof way to do that. So we run a counter experiment, and that's the HNCOCA, where we do a different type of transfer. Instead of going from nitrogen to the C alpha, we go to the nitrogen to the carbonyl. And that's a one-way street because the coupling between the nitrogen and the next carbonyl is, is pretty much um, uh, insignificant. So the so magnetization transfer goes one way. And if you look at the experiment, the HNCOCA, it gives you the uh, correlation of the HSQC peak to the N minus one C alpha. Now you have two C alphas, one in, in this uh, HNCA spectra. In the N minus one, we have only one, sorry, the HNCOCA, we only have one C alpha. Thus, using a combination of this, we can unambiguously tell which is the C alpha and the C alpha minus one. So this entire trick of going through the carbonyl has been exploited in multiple ways. You can see the HNCO experiment where we only record the CO. But then if you go from CO to CA, we go to um, both ways. So essentially we go to its own C, um, uh, CO and the neighboring uh, CA. So essentially what you'll get is that you'll get both the CO experiments. So HNCO gives you correlation to the N minus one, COCA gives the correlation to um, both the CEOs because we go to the CA and then go to the CO, similar to the HNCACB. Now, what is the problem in using these experiments for larger proteins? This is from a very old paper by Michael Sattler and, and uh, it, it uh, uh, still is, is very valid. And there's another wonderful paper by um, um, Constant, Constant Pervusion's group and Ilya's group that they looked at um, um, uh, the relaxation mechanisms and the relative sensitivity of all these uh, uh, triple resonance experiments. But the general theme holds good. So the most sensitive experiment in this suit of experiments is the HNCA. 
So here, what you see is the sensitivity of the experiment related to the NHSQC. This is a two-dimensional experiment, and all these things are three-dimensional experiment, which include additional magnetization transfer. And in solution state NMR, we always like to start with a high gamma nuclei and end with the high gamma nuclei because the sensitivity of a multidimensional experiment is given by the formula where the signal to noise is proportional to the gamma of the excited nucleus and the gamma of the detected nucleus to the power of three by two. Now, if we start with hydrogen and end with hydrogen, we get a much better sensitivity. But what this also, uh, the drawback of this is that we need to do additional magnetization transfer because if you want to start with hydrogen and end with the hydrogen in an HNCA experiment, you need to first start with the amide hydrogen. Then you go to the um, uh, nitrogen. From nitrogen, you, you do a magnetization to the C alpha. You encode the C alpha frequency. Then from the C alpha, you do another magnetization transfer to the nitrogen. You encode the nitrogen frequency. And then you do another magnetization to the, um, to the amide proton. And then you, in the direct dimension, you record the amide proton frequency. And the question that we need to think about is that why don't we just start with the C alpha resonance uh, and then encode the C alpha, go to nitrogen and go to um, hydrogen at the end. There you will lose the sensitivity by a factor of four because you're starting with the, um, um, with the uh, C alpha uh, magnetization, which has the gamma that is one fourth of hydrogen. Now the question uh, we'd like to think about is that why don't we start with H alpha? and then go to C alpha and then uh, end on nitrogen? That's a very good question. And there are experiments that are um, um, available for, for us to do that, but it has other problems when we go to larger systems and then we will look at what those problems are uh, in the next couple of slides. Now, here is a relative intensity of the different experiments. And here is putting that in, into, into a, a pictorial form. So this is from, um, a, a, a protein that a postdoc in the lab, uh, Thibault Vinay is working on. It's a, it's a phosphatase, it's about 38 kilodaltons, and it could be only concentrated to about a 200 micromolar. What you're seeing here is one two-dimensional experiment, which is the Trozy HSQC, and two projections of a three-dimensional experiment. Now you can see that the HNCA has a subset, uh, I'll say about, uh, um, uh, you, can, you can see the numbers down. So the HSQC has 262 peaks. The HNCA has 172 peaks, but whereas the HNCACB has only about 12 peaks. So the idea is that when we go to larger and larger proteins, uh, the experiments that give you other dimensional of matches to break the degeneracy in the HNCA become no longer are viable because of additional transfers, because of the nature of the, uh, of the nuclei they're getting transferred to. So this is what is summarized in the previous slide as the relative sensitivity of these other experiments and also pictorially over here. Now, here is a problem that we are uh, stuck with when we go to larger systems. HNCA is the most sensitive experiment that we have that gives you a sequential correlation. HNCO could be a bit more sensitive. The question we also, also need to think about is CO has a chemical shift on isotropy and what would be the sensitivity of the HNCO at a 1.2 gigahertz? And I'll let the, um, I don't have an answer to that. We probably can theoretically calculate, but it'll be wonderful to see what the uh, sensitivity of these experiments are at high field. But HNCA is a wonderful experiment that gives you, of all the experiments, that gives you a relatively high sensitivity. But the problem with the HNCA is the degeneracy. And to highlight the degeneracy, what we have, what I'm showing you here is the C-alpha chemical shift and the distribution from the BMRB database. So if you look at the C-alpha chemical shift that is depicted here in, in blue, they are pretty much around 55 ppm, except for glycine. Um, and now you can see the distribution is also not very, uh, uh, very high within this. So this causes the degeneracy problem because when you're going to look for a match, there are several other chemical shifts that would cause this degeneracy. So the way you break the degeneracy is by uh, the difference in the C beta chemical shift, which starts from alanine from 20. And you can see there are a group of amino acids that has the C beta chemical shift at 30. There are a group of them that have the C beta chemical shift at 40. And you have a couple of them that have it even uh, at, at higher than the C alpha chemical shift. So now if you find a degeneracy in the C alpha, you break it with the uh, degeneracy, with, the, with the, uh, the diversity in the C beta chemical shift. But unfortunately, we can't get to the C beta chemical shift for larger proteins. It's because of the sensitivity of the HNCA-CB experiment. 
So one way of mitigating this problem is by asking the simple question, what if we increase the resolution of the C alpha spectrum? Can we, are we able to uh, break this degeneracy? Typically, what people record in, a, in an HNCA experiment is a resolution of about 40 hertz, which is shown here in cyan. And what we want to do is to get to a resolution about uh, for very few hertz, which is shown here in blue, in dark blue. So that's the name of the game we're going to play today. This entire lecture is that, how can we get to higher resolution? And if we can't get to higher resolution, how do we encode more information into the C alpha that will help us break the degeneracy? I'm going to leave that as and pause for a second because that's going to be the, the central uh, idea for the next 30 to 40 minutes that we're going to talk about. So the problem is that when we go to higher, uh, to summarize, when we go to large, higher molecular weight proteins, uh, they tumble slower. They have a lot more resonances. As a result of that, you have spectral crowding, resonance broadening. And uh, the experiments that give you additional dimension of matches, which is correlating to the CB or the CO, do not work properly. So HNCAs are only uh, hope to do that. But the problem with HNCA is we have degeneracy. So how do we break this problem is a question that we're going to decide. So first of all, let's ask the very simple question. How do I go from the cyan spectrum to the blue spectrum? That's very simple. You just record your data longer and longer. So here I show you three FIDs. And uh, you can show the first FID, the second FID, and the third FID is recorded for increasing amount of times. And if you look at the corresponding Fourier transform, you get uh, uh, a much more sharpening of the intensity. And this holds good for any spectrum where you limit, uh, the only limit you have is a T2 of the spectrum. So you can record as long as you record your FID until pi T2, you're going to get an increase in resolution where pi T2 is your inherent line width. And that's where you're, after that, your resolution would not increase. But what happens to a sensitivity is also a different question because it's a decaying FID. As you go longer and longer, you're going to have less signal and more noise. So there are two opposing things that you're trying to um, compensate for. One is you need more higher resolution, but you also need sensitivity. Now, this idea that I told you that if you acquire longer, only works if the FID hasn't relaxed. Now I'm going to take the same FID and I'm going to uh, be going to make it relax about 2.5 times faster. Now we can see the longer you go, um, there's no additional resolution that you get. So let's bank this idea that as long as relaxation allows, the longer you acquire the FID, the better your resolution is. And also we need to keep in mind here, the longer acquisition is happening in the indirect dimension and not the direct dimension. So for every additional point that you need to take, you need to spend experimental time. So, but nowadays there are things like non-uniform sampling that allows us to access these longer um, um, time periods of evolution in the indirect dimension at a practical time that we can record the spectrum in. Now I talked to you about relaxation. So as I told you, we can acquire the FID longer if the relaxation allows. So here are some theoretical calculation of the relaxation rates as a function of molecular correlation time. So you see, you see the relaxation rate on the y-axis and the correlation time, which in turn, um, with some approximation, could be um, thought of the as, a, as the molecular weight of the protein you're investigating. Now here you want is what you want a nucleus with, with, with the lower slope, which means which relaxes slower which allows you to record the FID for longer. But what you can see here is the two fastest relaxing nucleus is the C alpha and the H alpha. And now I come back to the point that why we don't start our, our, our experiments with the H alpha to C alpha transfer for larger proteins is because whenever you have C alpha transfers for any time period, it's going to relax very fast when it's protonated. And I want to pay attention, to, uh, draw your attention to the C alpha's relaxation rate when it's deuterated. And you will normally see about uh, two lines over here, one in um, solid and the one dotted. And the one in solid uh, is at 800 megahertz and the one dotted is at uh, 500 megahertz. And you'll see the solid line and the dotted line will remain very close for everything except the carbonyl. And you can see for the carbonyl, the solid line at 800 megahertz relaxes much faster compared to the 500 megahertz. And this is where the chemical system isotropy of the carbonyl comes into play. 
again, a topic for a different day. But now let's get back to the topic where I want you to pay attention to the C-alpha relaxation rate when it's protonated vis-a-vis -vis deuterated. It's one of the largest benefactors of deuterations. When deuterated, the C-alpha relaxes very slowly compared to when it's protonated. In fact, it even relaxes slower than the trozy component of the amide proton. The only thing that relaxes slower than that is the nitrogen um, trozy component. And this is critical because when deuterated, we have this unique opportunity of increasing the resolution in the C-alpha dimension because it allows for longer acquisition of the FID. Now, how do we look at this in terms of uh, molecular weight of proteins that we are familiar with? If you acquire the spectra in the indirect dimension until the line width, which is pi t2, that's the time that you need to acquire FID from. For proteins as high as about 180 to 82 kilodaltons, you can get a line width of about 14 hertz. Then it's deuterated. So that's a key to good. That's a key to remind. So now let's say if you stop this particular lecture right now, and uh, uh, you guys are uh, thought. Uh, uh, that you have a fantastic system, you go to the lab and you start recording the spectra to pi t2, you're going to be very disappointed in me. Because what you'll see is that after some time in the carbon dimension, your resolution no longer increases, but your peak actually doubles. And the reason that because of that is that beyond a resolution of about 35 hertz, again, depends on, on, on the system that you're looking at, there's a coupling between the C alpha and the C beta that evolves which cause your peak to be split into two. And this is a homonuclear coupling. So how do we negate this homonuclear coupling and then still record spectra that have very high resolution? There are some tricks that are in our textbooks that we can think of using it. And one of the trick is what's called a constant time experiment. So in this case, the total evolution period of, the, of a particular nuclei is set to some integral multiple of the coupling that we are trying to avoid. So that the coupling goes to zero and then um, the peaks uh, um, um, are devoid of the coupling. But the problem with the constant time experiment is that the first data point that you collect has already experienced the relaxation of either one over two J or one over J. And here, that time period is pretty long because our J is only 35 hertz. So for the very first data point you're collecting, instead of having the full FID uh, at, at, at a zero time point or, or, or at a very small increment of the, of, the, of the delay, you're experiencing a 28 millisecond delay. So your first FID is already going to be very low in intensity compared to the, um, um, uh, the, the spectra that you would do in a real time experiment. So here we take what I show you, we take a very small protein, GB1 in this case, and then we record um, things with one constant time, two constant times. You can think of this as a delay of one over two J, one over J, et cetera. And you can see as we go to higher and higher constant times, the signal gets sharper, but even for a very small protein GB1, the intensity decreases. Now, one of the questions you might ask is that why does incurrency go up and intensity decreases? Just to keep in mind, when we're collecting up to up to three constant times, we're collecting more data points. We're collecting a lot more data points, and this is a projection along the, along the carbon dimension. Here, here we are collecting more, more FIDs, but still our intensity decreases even for a very small protein. This constant time experiment for the resolution that we're trying to hope, hoping to get wouldn't even work for ubiquitin. So this is constant time is not going to work for us. The other part you can do is that, so we are, we are now restricted by the coupling. So one of the things that we can do is we can do a, a selective decoupling on the C beta. And uh, uh, at this time when we started the project, there's some lovely methods by uh, Eric Skupche and others where they have these selective uh, decoupling on the C beta. But the problem with the C beta decoupling is that the C beta chemical shifts uh, have a uh, and overlap with the C alpha chemical shift. The C beta come all the way to about 42 ppm and your glycine chemical shift starts at about 42 ppm. So normally what you'll see is that you'll see two problems, the C beta decoupling. One is that the glycines would be marred. The signals would be, would be um, um, not how they should appear. And also you will see block seeker shifts. So block seeker shifts is essentially a shift in the chemical uh, um, 
uh, the frequency of a given nuclei when you play around with the same with, with the nearby frequency of the same nuclei. And you normally observe this in homonucleity coupling. There are ways to negate the block seeker shift, but um, in this, especially if you can put two pulses, which is surrounded by a 180 degree pulse, then you negate the block seeker shift, which is a standard trick that is in the pulse sequences. Uh, one, be, uh, if, if you see the standard pulse sequence from Brooker, there'll be, if you're doing a CO decoupling, there'll be two CO pulses surrounded by a 180 degree pulse. Now, the other uh, way that we can do the decoupling is a virtual decoupling. So we know what the coupling is. And then let's say if the coupling is about 35 Hertz, um, we can pretty much think about uh, multiplying with the inverse of the coupling. But for a system that is, when we're evolving this for very long uh, time periods, this only works if the coupling is uniform, which is in the case of the C alpha C beta coupling, it is not. The coupling can vary anywhere from about 32 Hertz to 42 Hertz. Now here is a, a spectrum of GB1. And we can see the beautiful doublets that come because of the C alpha C beta coupling. If I choose the deconvolution um, um, coupling to about 35 Hertz, the one with the 35 Hertz gets perfectly deconvolved. Whereas the one, the bottom one has a 38 Hertz coupling um, that gets marred. Now, if I choose 38 Hertz, I get a good decoupling here, whereas the one with the 35 Hertz gets, um, um, gets distorted. So there are ways that we could do this. There are ways uh, currently developed by Hansen and other people who are developing this new virtual uh, decoupling. But at this point, when we were trying this, none of them gave us the three techniques that were on the books during that time, gave us a proper way to increase the resolution in the C alpha dimension, uh, mitigating the coupling that had it to the C beta. So then we naively thought we could approach this biochemically. So the reason the C alpha uh, uh, is split into a doublet is because the C beta is 13 C labeled. What if we could make a protein biochemically where the C alpha is 13 C labeled and the C beta is unlabeled? Now you can, uh, and you can deuterate the protein. Now you can essentially let the C alpha evolve merrily and you get very increasingly higher resolutions, which is going to partly mitigate the problem of degeneracy. Is there a question there? Or? Um, yeah, so actually, yeah. I, I think the, um, this is a good uh, point to interrupt you for a bit because yeah. we uh, got a, uh, two, actually two very good questions. Okay. Um, so the first question is, can you uh, explain a little bit why the uh, protonated C alpha relax fast, like actually faster than many of the other uh, combinations? Okay. And what is the second question so that I can see? Uh, and the second question uh, is raised by in, uh, by what Maskey uh, in the audience um, asking, is there a break point between the gain in relaxation and the loss of the signal due to the de deterioration for say alpha? Okay, so um, is there a break point between the gain and the loss of the signal due to deprotonation? Sorry, deterioration. Yeah, so I, I think I understand both the questions and uh, uh, Walt, if I'm not answering your question, uh, um, ping me uh, again. Um, so what is it that causes uh, the relaxation of the, the C alpha to go lower? I think um, if you open up Ilya's finish, the answer would be very evident. So relaxation happens due to two mechanisms. And if you could open up our uh, books to relax, look at the relaxation equation, there is a dipole induced mechanism and there is a CSA mechanism that causes relaxation. And if you look at the dipolar term, there is a term that is a product of the gyromagnetic ratio of the two nuclei that is involved. Now let's assume that carbon is interacting with hydrogen vis-a-vis -vis carbon is interacting with the deuterium. The gyromagnetic ratio of the deuterium is about one sixth that of the carbon, that of the hydrogen. And that appears as a quadratic term in the equation. So when you substitute um, uh, this hydrogen by a, a deuterium, you're already theoretically, let's say, you are um, getting a factor of 36 reduction. I'm hoping that I'm, I'm getting that point. So in the, in the regular dipolar uh, uh, equation, so essentially you have the product of the gyromagnetic ratio and it appears as a quadratic term. So now the product of the gyromagnetic ratio of hydrogen is about uh, six times more than the deuterium. 
So ideally, we should see at least a 36 uh, times uh, uh, increase in uh, uh, decrease in relaxation when we go to the deuterium. But in our practicality, that number gets down to about eight due to several factors. One of the factors also that comes in the same equation is that you have the product of the geromagnetic ratio, and you also have the distance between the two nuclei. So it so happens that when you have a carbon-hydrogen bond vis-a-vis -a, -vis a carbon deuterium bond, this bond becomes shorter. Now that increases the relaxation because now they're closer to each other. And then there are other factors. Uh, hydrogen is, uh, the deuterium is a spin one nuclear. There's a spin number that comes into the equation. So it, it, to answer your question very uh, briefly, uh, it's coming from the dipolar um, uh, contribution to the relaxation. And Walt's question is that, uh, if I could understand his question, are there proteins that um, you would benefit from deuteration vis-a-vis -vis protonation? Because protonation allows you to, let's say, transfer magnetization from proton to carbon, which essentially limits your, um, um, your uh, transfer time in these experiments. Uh, it really depends on the protein, but I would say anything about 18 kilodaltons, 1.8, is a part that we are slightly in the gray area, whether we know to, to do whether to go to a trosy-based system after deuteration or to a non-trosy HSQC-based system with protonation. So that's a point, that's a breaking point for me where we need to decide which way we need to go. Right. I will continue with this with this idea. So the idea here is that to remove the C beta and make it C12. So we naively thought and uh, uh, that we can use instead of glucose, which is traditionally what is used as a carbon source for to make these isotopically labeled protein, we can use pyruvate. So pyruvate is a three carbon system and you can get it uh, commercially by this labeled at either position one, position two, or position three, or any combination of them. Now, if pyruvate is used as a sole carbon source, and if you see how alanine is made by a simple amino transferase, if I choose a pyruvate that's only labeled at carbon two, then what I'll get is an amino acid that's labeled at the C alpha position, but not labeled at the C beta position. It's absolutely wonderful, and this is exactly what we wanted. But the wonder stops right there, because for any other amino acid, it's a little bit more complicated because they either go through three independent pathways, the TCA cycle, the gluconeogenesis cycle, or a fusion cycle, which we call the direct way. This is how the amino acids are derived from pyruvate as a carbon source. Here, things get more complicated. And now here are, is the pyruvate colored with the three amino acids in three different colors. And we can see where the amino acids go in these different cycles. So we use uh, the Sangle standard KEG database to identify where these, each of these amino acids would end up. I want you to keep uh, um, your, your eyes on glutamate where the C alpha is obtained from position number uh, three. Um, and if we go to alanine, it's obtained from position number two, so on and so forth. So depending on which amino acid is produced, then your, uh, your C alpha would end up from different parts of the pyruvate. This is one problem. The second problem is that if we go back to our textbooks and look at the TCA cycle, which probably all of them, all of us have memorized and, and conveniently forgotten, at least I did that, uh, the pyruvate enters the TCA cycle as a three carbon moiety. And then what happens is that there's a fusion that happens with oxaloacetate that results in a six carbon moiety, the citrate. Now, when this fusion happens, there is a chance that the carbons that were isolated over here, let's say if you take a two carbon alone pyruvate, could have carbons that are pr at proximal nature to each other. So that's a second problem with, with using this method. And uh, this cycle though stabilizes, but by the time you induce the cycle, we know that uh, it stabilizes and it gives you the same uh, type of amino acids. So now if you use a uh, two, three pyruvate, which is labeled in carbon in position two and three, what you'll see is that this is a strip from the HNCA, you see a doublet for alanine, you see a doublet for glutamate. If I use two pyruvate, you'll see a singlet, beautiful singlet for alanine, because alanine C al alpha is from uh, the position two and the C beta is position three. In this case, it's unlabeled. Whereas the glutamate peak looks uh, uh, very small and tiny. If you use three pyruvate, 
the alanine peaks is very small and tiny, uh, pretty much insignificant. Whereas the glutamate peak is larger, but it has a very unique shape. It has a shape where uh, it has a sing it has a singlet in the bit in between, and it has two doublets, or it has a doublet on either side, uh, uh, flanking the the singlet, which comes from the coupling that is introduced by the TCA cycle. Now the C beta becomes labeled as well. Once we saw the spectrum, we should have stopped because it's not working the way that we um, uh, wanted to work. And this is one of the examples we, we uh, kept trying and we found something beautiful serendipitously. So we thought, okay, we don't have a full representation of alanine here because alanine is coming from position two. But what if we mix two samples? I make one, the protein in two pyruvate and the protein in three pyruvate and mix them together. I should get both of them. But a better way that we found out to do is to grow the protein in the presence of two and three pyruvate. The reason we came to this conclusion is because when we put both of them together, when the mixing happens in the TCA cycle, the presence of the second carbon gets diluted because you have an equal chance of mixing either two or the three pyruvate. If you mix two and three, or three and two, what you have is that you reduce the chances of having neighboring carbons C alpha labeled. So now what you'll see is that the alanine is a beautiful peak, it's a singlet. The glutamate is also a, 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 a very um, prominent peak rather than a very weak peak that we saw with just the two pyruvate, but it has a singlet, which is the prominent peak in the middle, and it has a pair of uh, peaks, which is the doublet, which is reduced in intensity. And that's because how this, uh, uh, these, I mean, uh, these precursors are taken to the 3CA cycle. Now, what you'll see is a beautiful peak shape for each amino acid. So what you'll see is a central peak that is devoid of coupling. And then what you'll see is a pair of doublets that is due to the partial um, labeling of the C beta. And now for each of these amino acid, it has a rather distinct uh, peak shape. And we quantify that peak shape by the ratio of the uncoupled, which is the central peak that's devoid of the coupling to the coupled peak. Now, if you take the ratio for each of the amino acid, you can see that things that, uh, that get through the direct process, which is alanine, phenylalanine, glycine, these set of amino acid have um, a larger couple to uncoupled ratio, which means the central peak is going to be taller. With the TCA, you can see that um, um, things get a little bit more complex and you get more of the shoulders that, that will come in. And for uh, things that get to the fusion process, the, the ILV, it's even higher. But what you should notice here is that at any point in time, we are less than 50% in the couple to uncoupled ratio. That implies that the central peak is going to be at least twice as high as the surrounding shoulders. Now, what we have is that we have two properties with which we can do, um, we can compare our strips. The first property is the ability to take the central peak that's devoid of coupling. So here I show you an example from GB1. What you see here is the, uh, the peak that is at run at a standard resolution of about 40 Hertz. Now, the same sample, which is these two samples are made by the traditional method using glucose. Now we run it with extended resolution, but because of the C alpha C beta coupling, what you see here is a pair of doublets and you're not able to distinguish them. But when we use the pyruvate mix, you can actually clearly see because we collapse the, uh, the doublets and you can clearly see the, int the sequential and the intra peaks over here. So here, but even with extended resolution in the traditional case of glucose, you're not able to get the doublets because the doublets actually are in this, but there's an overlap in the C alpha dimension. And here, what you'll see is that the doublets are now collapsed. And then you see clearly see one peak for the internal and one peak for the sequential. Now what Scott tried to do with this was a very simple experiment. We took MBP and what we did was uh, we took the pyruvate label sample with this pre-mix pyruvate where we create peak shapes and dilute the coupling uh, between adjacent nucleus. And we asked a very simple question. What if we collect spectra up to a standard resolution of 42 Hertz? And here I show you the primary sequence of MBP, sit on each one of this amino acid and ask how many matches do I see for the C alpha minus one? 
and you can see it's color coded as a heat map. And you can see for most of them, we see matches up of about 10 to 20 residues that say, this is I'm your match. We can only assign some residues, which are the glycines, and we're able to assign them because of their characteristic chemical shift. The rest of them, we're not able to assign them at all, just from an HNCA experiment. Now let's take the same example and then go down to a resolution of about 4.8 hertz. Now you can see the number of matches drop down, and now we only the number of matches is between two and five. And then we are able to assign all the residues in green are, are assigned unambiguously. We're able to assign most of these residues. But even for these residues, and here what we are doing is that we are just using the central position as a marker for assignment. I hope this is clear because here we took the spectra at a resolution of about 42 hertz. And then uh, we asked the question, how many matches the C-alpha had? looking at only the central peak. Here we just increase the resolution and only looking at the central peak, we asked how many matches are there and how many of the residues we can unambiguously assign. Now, if you consider both the central peak position and the shape, something magical happens. So now what you can see is that this is the peak I'm looking for a match for. I want a C alpha minus one that matches this particular frequency. Now you can see there is two resonances that have the exact same central frequency, but one of them has the same shape that I'm looking for and the other one doesn't. Now, if you can use the central frequency and the shape that is provided by the spiroid labeling, you can now, uh, we just use it uh, in this case by a simple a regression fit. And now what you can do is that you can assign up to about 90% of the protein unambiguously. So what the pyruvate gives you is a central shape that, so just to keep, keep in mind, the, the difference, this is about 35 hertz between the two shoulders. So now we have a central peak that's extremely sharp, that's devoid of coupling, which you can use as a marker for assignment. And in case of degeneracy, you not only use the central peak position, you also use the central peak position and the line shape to get your assignments. Now, how fiddle is this? So here I show you the peak position for different occurrences of the valine in uh, MBP. And you can see that they're all uh, pretty similar uh, when it comes to how the peak looks, because this is just a property of how that particular amino acid is being derived out of the, uh, the, the biochemical nature of uh, how the amino acid is being derived. Now, what we're currently doing is, uh, because here we just considered a, a, a serendipitously the combination of, of uh, two and three pyruvate. We did, um, it's not completely serendipitous, but uh, we want to now explore where all would this labeling go if we use pyruvate. And this could have a, a, a important implications in other type of experiments for solution state NMR, uh, especially measuring relaxation, where you don't need to worry about the contribution from the neighboring carbon. If you get an alternatively labeled sample, uh, uh, it would also help in getting aromatic assignments and aromatic noses because the aromatic carbon-carbon coupling is about 60 hertz which really re limits the resolution on the aromatic carbon. So there's a number of things that is useful for, and we also posted that it'll be useful for solid state spectroscopists where you can get um, um, uh, uh, dipolar coupling without uh, uh, the, uh, the presence of the neighboring uh, carbon. So what Maxim has done is that he has taken one pyruvate, two pyruvate, three pyruvate, and all combinations of them. And then he has made uh, proteins with multiple um, um, induction times. And the idea here for us is to use a series of well uh, documented experiment, like a high resolution HSQC, a constant time HSQC, the HNCO plane that gives information on the carbonyl labeling, uh, the aromatic trozy, uh, et cetera, to identify for each of the amino acid, where does the labeling go when a certain um, uh, combination or a certain species of pyruvate is used. So for example, if you look at the C-alpha, it'll have this um, a complicated pattern when the neighboring C-alphas are present or not, because the C-alpha is uh, connected to a, a CO, and you can see the different couplings that happen when depending upon when it's connected to the CO or uh, the C-beta. Similarly, for a tertiary carbon, you have this intri intricate pattern, but when the coupling is not there, this pattern will collapse. So now what's gonna happen is that each of these pattern is with a particular labeling scheme is going to give you additional information about the nature of the 
amino acid that it's derived from. So uh, we, uh, this is a work in progress. And as you can see, Maxim has um, um, uh, shown um, uh, a distribution of uh, the population of each of these atoms that is C13 labeled and um, uh, the and from the number of amino acids within the same sequence, we see what the spread in this particular labeling is, which is rather tight. So here is alanine C alpha, alanine C beta, when we use different pyruvate sources. So you can see one pyruvate, two pyruvate, three pyruvate, a combination of one and two, et cetera. And uh, similarly for uh, isoleucine, uh, every single atom of isoleucine. So we hope to publish this very soon. So this could be useful for other people um, to not only uh, use this for, this for the type of experiments that we are using, but also leverage this for the type of experiments, the combination of pyruvates that they want it to be, uh, to be labeled as. So here are some representative conclusions as to where the major pattern goes if you use the pyruvate. Um, and uh, for isoleucine, for example, you can see um, uh, this position is derived from one and you can see the alpha position is derived from two, so on and so forth. Now, uh, what are some of the practical considerations that one needs to follow when using this alternate uh, um, labeling strategy? For you, for us to get such a higher um, um, in uh, resolution in the carbon dimension, we need longer acquisition. So we can't just use a regular acquisition. We need to go to much longer times, but the relaxation in this case allows it to, to go to a much longer time. So we can go to about 60 to 90 milliseconds on the carbon dimension, and that's what gives you the higher resolution. Deuteration is mandatory because without deuteration, the C alpha is going to relax very fast and it's not going to uh, work uh, without, without deuteration. Now, how do we get this in a deuterated, uh, do we get deuterated pyruvate? The beauty of pyruvate is that you don't need to get deuterated pyruvate. So this is the type of C13 pyruvate that, that we order. So normally when we grow it in D2O, all we need to do is drop the pH uh, to about uh, 13 and then and put it into D2O, then this H, uh, the CH3 would exchange to CD3. All you need to do is get back the pH by adding the phosphates and then grow your protein. So you don't need deuteration. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, you, when you're doing this exchange from CH3 to CD3, you need to do this in a liter of D2O. If you do it in 50 ml, then what's going to happen is that the concentration of um, the pyruvate is so high that you get aldol condensation. So that's the other uh, uh, thing to keep in mind is that this has to be done at a sufficiently dilute concentration where the exchange happens and alcohol concentration does not happen. The other key problem, which is the, in my opinion, the major problem in using pyruvate or in using any deuteration in this case is the back exchange. Because when you're growing the protein, the NHs are uh, NDs or N attached to a deuteron. But when you're going to observe the protein, you want the NHs because you're experiments start with the amide hydrogen and go to the amide nitrogen. If that amide hydrogen is a deuterium, then you have a problem. Now, the other problem when we come to pyruvate is the following. So for example, when the uh, nitrogen is attached to a hydrogen, vis-a-vis -vis the nitrogen is attached to a deuterium, there's going to be different chemical shifts for the nitrogen in these two cases, which we call the isotope shift. Not only for the nitrogen, the chemical shift of the C alpha and the CO also changes when the nitrogen is attached to a hydrogen vis-a-vis -vis a nitrogen is attached to a deuterium. There's a beautiful paper by Atreya that actually leverages this to look at HD exchange, this, this isotopic shift between the fact that nitrogen is attached to a hydrogen uh, versus nitrogen attached to a deuterium. Now, let's say you have an amino acid where the nitrogen at the position I is fully attached to the hydrogen and the nitrogen at position I minus Y, uh, I minus one is partly attached to a deuterium and partly attached to a hydrogen. This is because of improper back exchange. Now, this species is not going to contribute for the signal because um, in the way that the I minus one residue behaves, because there is not going to be any transfer from this deuterium to the nitrogen. But what's going to happen is that the very fact that this attached to the deuterium is going to change the chemical shift of this C alpha versus this C alpha. Now, if you transfer the magnetization from this hydrogen to the nitrogen and the C alpha minus one, you're going to transfer to two C alpha minus ones. 
and those are going to be about um, uh, shifted by the isotopic chemical shift. And you'll, as a resultant, what's going to happen is that the peak shape is going to be broader than you normally used to. And this is something to keep in mind. There are different ways to ensure a proper back exchange, depending on the protein of your interest. You can heat them up. You can, um, the exchange process is also pH dependent. If your protein tolerates basic pHs, it's better to keep the protein at basic pHs for quite some time uh, so that the back exchange happens. People sometimes partially denature the protein using urea, mild urea, and then renature it back so that all your NHs are back exchange. So these are some of the practical considerations that are, that I would have. Um, so how much more time do we have? Uh, we target to end at 11, well, uh, oh, you know, in another seven minutes. Um, okay, what I'll do is that uh, yep. I will quick, quickly go to one other quick concept and touch on it, and I will not expand on it uh, due to this uh, the time limitation, and then we will come back to, uh, if there is enough interest in looking at the other concept, I can, I can give another lecture at some other point of time. Right. So now all I've presented over here is taking a standard HNCA experiment. You don't need to do anything else. And just use the power of biochemistry that pyruvate offers you to impart different line shapes that are amino acid dependent. I hope that is very clear because this works with a very standard HS, uh, HNCA. There's nothing else we need to do uh, differently in this particular case. And this gives us two orthogonal piece of information. One is a central peak that is devoid of coupling to very high resolution that we can mitigate some of the degeneracy problems. And if degeneracy still exists, the amino acid specific coupling patterns of the residual coupling to the C beta will help us break this degeneracy. But if you look at the relaxation demands on this experiment, it's exactly the same as what happens in an HNCA experiment. Now let's take a case, and I want to leave you with this particular thought is that can we achieve the same thing using pulses? And here's where uh, the work of Paul Coote in my lab uh, comes in. So here's the situation that we have. We have, we are running an HNCA where we are evolving the C alpha chemical shift. And the resolution in this is um, uh, restrained by the coupling to the C beta. Now the question is that can we faithfully decouple the C beta during this evolution of the C alpha and also decouple the carbonyl because the C alpha is, is connected to the C beta as well as the carbonyl. Can we do that without closing any block Seeger shifts? Now, Paul uses optimal control pulse design and, and that should be, I think, a, a different topic for a different day. How to think of pulses as not starting at uh, Z and coming all the way to Y, but it could traverse different parts along the block sphere. It could have a common origin and a common endpoint, but these optimal control theory pulses allow you to traverse different paths along this, the sequence of the pulse and all of this, uh, the necessary um, atoms and the resonances come to a standard point. And this is what optimal control theory allows us to do. The pulses could be complicated and um, and uh, so this is a one millisecond pulse. You can see the RF amplitude and the phase are, are not as standard as what you would see in a square pulse, but it does what we want to do. So in this case, what we want to do is that we want to decouple the C beta from the C alpha, as well as the carbonyl without crossing any block Seeger shifts. So you, you, here you can see uh, the doublet, that's due to the C beta uh, coupling. But it, it, when we use the optimal control pulse, you can see a singlet. And the singlet is exactly in between uh, the two. So we have absolutely no block Seeger shifts when we do these type of experiments. So if you open up a standard Bruker pulse sequence for an HNCA, uh, this is the C alpha evolution. So you have the first inup that takes your magnetization from hydrogen to nitrogen. Then you go to nitrogen to C alpha and you're evolving, evolving the C alpha. Now, what you'll see the pulse sequence is rather complicated over here because uh, the need for us to decouple the CO and the CO decoupling would cross a block Seeger shift. So normally we put a 180 degree pulse and sandwich another CO decoupling to, re to reverse the block Seeger shift. But in our pulse sequence, it's very simple. All we do is that for the first millisecond, where the pulse that we want to use is about a millisecond long, we just let the C alpha evolve, only refocusing the nitrogen in between the evolution time period. Now, after the milliseconds, when we have space, for our pulse to go in, we 
We put in our pulse and the pulse does the following. It refocuses the C beta chemical shift. It refocuses the CO chemical shift without crossing any block Seeger shifts. And we just need one pulse right in the middle of the CA evolution. Now, in designing these pulses, we could have several variations. We could have a pulse that is shown here in red that will invert the magnetization of the C beta chemical shift of all these amino acids, but not these amino acids, which is leucine, um, aspartate, phenylalanine, tyrosine, et cetera. Now, the purple pulse will decouple pretty much everything except for serines and threonines. And the yellow pulse will only invert these amino acids in between and it'll leave alanine and these amino acids out. Now, by the choice of which of these pulses you're using, so here you can see on the left a, a spectra that is without any decoupling. So you'll see the pair of doublets that's because of the C uh, coupling to the C beta. Now, depending upon which of these pulses that we use, you either get a singlet or a doublet. Keep in mind, this is done using samples that are grown in glucose. So we don't have the pyruvate labeling here. Now, for example, if for lysine, which is in the center, both the red, purple, and yellow pulse decouple, so you get a perfect singlet. But if you take alanine, the purple and the red pulse will decouple, but the yellow pulse would not decouple because it's not covering the C-beta chemical just of the alanine, and you get a doublet with the yellow pulse, and you get a, a singlet with the purple and the blue pulse. So de depending on the choice of the pulse that you use to decouple, and in an amino acid C-beta frequency dependent manner, you get different peak shapes. Now let's go to the same problem where we had the degeneracy. I'm sitting on a C alpha, I get all these uh, other C alphas as degenerate peaks. Now, if I use the yellow pulse, this splits into a doublet, whereas this, the resonance I'm looking for a match also splits into a doublet, the other things become a singlet. Now let's look at the red pulse. Uh, it still remains a doublet. So now if I follow the peak that I'm looking at with the different resonances and with the different peak shapes, now I can tell that the peak in the middle is a match, whereas these two peaks are not a match. Now the way to think about it is that you incorporate C beta specific information based on the choice of the decoupling profile that we, that we use. The way that we use these decoupling profiles here are a yes, no type decoupling profiles. In this case, anything within this bandwidth will be decoupled. Anything above this bandwidth will not be decoupled with a very sharp transition point. And now what uh, Paul has been uh, working on um, um, of late is to see if we can go to a gradient type decoupling where it's not an on off, but where it's partially on or partially off. And this gives us very intricate um, uh, peak shapes. And I would probably uh, stop at this particular point um, because there's a, a lot, this is a lot to unpack in the last five minutes. And uh, I'd also like to point out that this method not only allows us to incorporate different peak shapes to get the assignment and break the degeneracy from a simple HNCA experiment, but also helps us to triangulate the C beta frequency. So we can actually get the C beta frequency without uh, even running an HNCA CB experiment. And uh, we call these belugas, uh, C beta assignment by echolocation using gradient decoupling. As you know, this the uh, the beluga was name was first thought about, and then we uh, thought about the acronym. Now, um, how do people use this? So, uh, I think one thing that we are um, we have in our lab, a theme in the lab, is that the utility of any technique depends on the ease of its particular use. So, if you run these cops, how would you do the assignment? So you're working, uh, in this case, Harrison is working with CCP and MR to incorporate modules of this into, into CCP and MR. So you can actually load the spectrum into CCP and MR and it'll give you the different peak shapes. If you can click on it from the different H and uh, the COP experiments, and you can simply click on a button when we know which is the right match that you're looking for. And it'll also calculate the C beta uh, chemical shift for you. It'll give you a figure of merit, et cetera. Now, these two experiments, I'm going to leave you with this particular point. These two experiments that I told you, one is using um, uh, a set of interesting pulses that will do a C beta specific decoupling and the pyruvate where the shape comes from the biochemistry or orthogonal piece of data, which we can combine together. So for example, if I take the pyruvate label sampling and add the COPs together, 
where we still have degeneracy, we can break that degeneracy because now the degeneracy is going to be breaking on the C-beta specific uh, decoupling that these COPs gives you. Now, what Ilya and, uh, and Luke are working on is using these shapes that the pyruvate decoupling uh, gives you with machine learning to automate the process of assignment of large proteins. Um, again, this is a topic for a, for a completely different day as to how they do it. They, they uh, simulate a lot of these data uh, using the chemical shift positions, the J coupling information, and uh, uh, from the BMRB uh, data bank. And uh, um, uh, just by using the image of the peak, we can train these things to get amino acid specific information, which could be used uh, to to assign. With that, I just want to conclude by share, share, showing you that we by sharing with you that we have two orthogonal methods, one biochemistry based and one um, based on optimal control theory. Both of these methods use a very standard HNCA experiment that has a relaxation demands of nothing greater than the HNCA experiment, but we incorporate additional information either on the peak shapes or on the relative intensities, and these could be used for assigning larger proteins which will now open the gateway for us to study relatively large proteins by NMR. With that, I would like to thank the people who actually did the work. Uh, the pyruvate labeling has been a, a long effort going in my lab. It started with Scott Robson, and now a, a, a team of people, uh, Maxim, Harrison, Abhinav, uh, David, Thibault, Patrick, and Krishna are working on that. Because for me to properly inform Ilya on uh, all the labeling patterns, we need a lot of data uh, to train the ML network. So there's a lot of protein pr people working on, a, on an array of protein. Um, and for the, uh, the optimal control theory, the project is spearheaded by Paul Coot and uh, uh, again, worked on by Harrison, Abhinav, Thibault and Sir John. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the collaborations that we have CCP and MR, where we can put some of these methods into the CC of NMR pa package so that people can directly use pyruvate labeling and automated methods to assign their proteins. The machine learning part uh, is a collaboration with uh, Ilya and Uluk and uh, Gerhard and co for a lot of uh, discussions on, on several topics, uh, mostly nitrogen detection and also topics over here. And uh, Wolfgang is a, a godsend for, for me and for, I think for the, uh, Wolfgang, for the entire uh, NMR communities because when people look at optimal control pulses, there is a certain amount of fear. Uh, they'll say, oh my God, these are um, a beast that we can't handle. But today, if you want to run an optimal control pulse design, any of the COPS experiment, all you need to do is retrieve the parameter set, get ProSol, and then it's ready to go. It's just another pulse. And that was made possible by Wolfgang, which automatically takes these pulses. It looks at what field strength your current your magnet is and calibrates uh, the, the power level for these optimal control pulses based on the standard hard 90. So um, these pulses are available either through my website and uh, we also strive to make these available through the Bruker standard release. So it should be accessible for anybody to use that. So with that, I will probably stop, get back the screen, and I'll be more than happy to have a discussion on, on any of the other topics. Yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I already see quite a few questions raised in the Q&A channels. So uh, the first question is uh, from uh, what, again, um, what would you expect if you use a mixture of a carbon-13 labeled and unlabeled glucose, say you make a uh, 30 to 40 percent of a uh, C13 glucose in the growth medium. That's a good question, Walt. Uh, what we expect is depending upon. We haven't tried that particular experiment. We have tried the use of one C13 uh, glucose labeling. But what we expect, Walt, when we use depending on the carbon unlabeled carbon, you would expect a reduction in the intensities uh, of the peak. The one thing we do not want to do is to sacrifice on um, the sensitivity of the experiments. And uh, so carbon is a six labeled, uh, and it's labeled in all six positions. So I wouldn't be able to guess as to what would happen, but what uh, uh, with the peak shapes, but what I know is that the intensity is going to go down quite a bit. All right. And uh... 
the next question from the anonymous attendee is asking, does one need to stick to a very specific and a particular species of bacteria to make sure that the metabolic pathways and the rates are the same each time? That's a very good question. Uh, this is something that we are currently uh, exploring. Uh, we have tried, I think, BL21D3 and BL21P lysase. But if I had to take a guess, I think the TCA and the pathways are very similar. And by the time you reach the protein where you induce it at an OD of 0.6, the things would have stabilized and the peak shapes would look exactly the same. But having said that, uh, we haven't tried different. We only tried a couple of them, but we haven't tried all species. For example, like things like a Rosetta strain or other strain, we haven't tried a few of that. It's in the works, but before we publish, we would probably give you more information. And if I had to take a guess, it would be the same. The answer is Great. I don't have a proof of it yet. Yeah. Great. So I actually got another question from uh, Asif uh, Akobal, uh, uh, one of our committees, uh, sent me a direct message uh, with optimal control pulse decoupling. Do you need to re-optimize the pulse parameters for each offset with and the bandwidth you want to decouple? Can you decouple segregated resonances with optimal control pulses? So yes, the answer is yes, but I need to qualify that. So the optimal control pulses work on uh, the principle that what bandwidth we want to use and what bandwidth we don't want to use. There are different ways of designing it. So let's say I'm interested in decoupling a particular frequency. Let's say I want to decouple frequencies between 20 and 40 ppm, and I don't care about anything else. That's a particular class. Now let's say I'm interested in decoupling between 20 and 40 ppm, but I'm also interested that nothing should happen to the magnetization between 40 and uh, 60 ppm, which is where your C alpha uh, appears. So this is a special constraint. So we want to invert the magnetization and you also want the constraint that you want the magnetization in a particular frequency to be uh, exactly the same. And then you don't care about anything else after that. So depending upon which modality that, that, that you choose, you got to design a different pulse. But once you have designed the pulse, let's say I've designed the pulse for a 600 megahertz, that's going to faithfully invert the magnetization between 20 ppm and uh, 40 ppm. It ensures that nothing happens to the magnetization that is evolving between 40 ppm and 60 ppm. And it's going to invert the magnetization between 160 ppm and 180 ppm. Once you design these pulses with these bandwidths, now, let's say if you want to go to an 800 megahertz, you just scale it. That's all you need to do. You just decrease uh, the uh, uh, the power level by a fact that is what well, is six by eight, and then you increase the so you decrease the power uh, the pulse length and you increase the power level. You don't need to redesign the pulse, and that's the beauty of these pulses. But let's say you have a different application and you want to do something different. Uh, then with the bandwidth and your bandwidth is changing. So you want only between 30 ppm and 40 ppm of inversion, then you need to redesign the pulse. Uh, does that answer your question, uh, Asif? Um, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. All right, uh, the next question is from Wada again. Uh, how often do C beta chemical shift vary from their canonical expected, expected values? And how do you identify those outliers? So uh, this, uh, the that is given the data that we have for maybe I could I should, I should share my screen again, uh, which would make this a little bit easier. Uh, let me. I guess still seeing the the presentation. Okay, how do I? Give me one second. Uh, a very interesting question, Walt. And let me go back to this particular slide. And uh, I'll go back here and share my screen. So here is the uh, the distribution of the C beta chemical shifts that we that we um, 
C from the BMRB, where the center is the is the uh, center of the peak position, and you see the deviation from the uh, all the chemicals that are deposited in the, in the in the BMRB. As you can see, for some of them, there's a larger variance compared to the other. Um, and it really depends on if some metal ions are binding and cysteines uh, also have a, uh, in this case, even though the variation is small for things that are involved in disulfide, you probably will have things that are different. Uh, but the variance is not any larger than what the, than what the C beta uh, variance is. And what is going to be different, Walt, which also adds an additional dimension of math, is the coupling constant between the C alpha and the C beta. For the same residues, you could have slightly different coupling constant depending on the uh, the geometry of that particular amino acid in that particular instance of the protein. And that would be an additional dimension of match that we consider in our um, um, matches over here. And that also something that Ilya and Uluk are trying to put this in, in there. Um, so for example, if you consider so now you can see that that's a central position and that is gives you the coupling. If the coupling is now about 40 hertz, the peak will look different over here. And for the same amino acid type, for the same uncoupled to coupled ratio, if the coupling is different, that could be used in additional dimension of match for us to uh, assign these uh, uh, proteins. Um, the next question is from Jobs uh, Liebo for the pyruvate-based approach what are the largest proteins that can be assigned? I suppose one limitation is that the signal to noise must be sufficient to see the complicated peak shapes. Yes, absolutely. I, I think you answer your, your, your own question. Um, the largest is very simple as to whatever, um, uh, it depends on the stability of the protein. It depends on the concentration of the protein. If you could give me a 200, uh, kilodalton protein at about 600 micromolar, we could do magic. But if you give me a 200 kilodalton protein at 20 micromolar or 100 micromolar, then there we have a problem. And for running these experiments, for the pyruvate experiments, our HNCA is no longer uh, a day. It's about two to three days, even with 10% sampling, because we need to sample higher along the carbon dimension. So the other requirement there is the um, the uh, sample should be stable for at least two to three days at, at room temperature. So these are the requirements. And I think one of the other questions, which also I think relates to this, I don't know if Walt meant that when he asked the question is that, as I told you, when you go longer and longer into the acquisition, um, you gain more resolution, but at the, at the expense of, of sensitivity. Right as you go further into, if you want to go to the absolute line width, which is pi t two, uh, you would lose sensitivity compared to an experiment that you recorded uh, with with fewer increments. Um, there is a study that is done by um, I think Jeff Hawk and uh, Sven Hebert and Gerhard Wagner, but they have shown clearly that if you go to one point two times t two, um, you there's no reason not to go that way because you will gain both sensitivity and resolution at the same time. And normally what we do traditionally is that we go to about 1.2 times T2 and then use um, 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 a reconstruction based technique, which is equal to linear prediction to predict an extra data set and increase our resolution. And that's something that we typically do in our cases. So to answer the question is the limit, uh, I would say we can easily go to about 200 kilodaltons because your resolution allows you to go for that. The problem would be uh, back exchange. How can you properly back exchange? The strength of your, uh, the concentration uh, of your sample and the stability of your sample. If you have all these three things together, we can easily go to 200 kilodaltons. Um, I guess the, uh, the next question from what again, uh, is sort of a related um, excellent talk, but I'll try again. When you deuterate protein, the signal intensity of the HNCA signal is reduced according to the deuteration amount, but the relaxation rate is also reduced, which gives a gain of the signal. For typical protein sizes, for example, 10 kilodalton, 50 kilodalton, 100 kilodalton, how much deuteration is optimal for each? I would... Uh subscribe to a model that um, you either fully deuterate it or not. Because what happens is that when you deuterate it, the, not only the C alpha um, relaxes slower, the trozy effect that is observed on the NH hydrogen is also um, better. 
because the NH hydrogen's closest dipole, uh, leaving alone what other protons are there, is coming from the H alpha because that's there no matter what. It's it's, it's the closest uh, hydrogen. So what what we have found and also we have calculated using spinach is that if you deuterate that hydrogen wall, which is at the C alpha position, your NH hydrogen relaxes about two points times uh, two point five times slower. Now. Uh, the cardinal rule I would always like to think about is that for anything less than 15 kilodaltons, I would like to um, keep it protonated. For anything more than that, I would like to investigate based on what the relaxation rates for that particular protein is, and then decide whether I need to deuterate it or not deuterate it. I am not a big fan of partial deuteration because I don't quite see the effort of a partial deuteration, might as well fully deuterate it and get both the trozy effect as well as the slower um, C alpha relaxing effect. Let's say if you're deuterating part partially, then you can't even leverage the experiment of the what we call the out and stay experiment, where you start from the H alpha magnetization and then have a shorter uh, ex experimental time, but then the, you either diluting your sample because you don't, all your carbons are H alpha labeled, and you're also not getting the benefit of what the, um, the deuteration is happening. So I would either put my um, bet on deuteration or not deuteration, depending on the protein, and for me, 15 to 18 kilodaltons is a cutoff where I need to think.